All right, so the text that we're going to be spending a little bit of time in this afternoon um, is a text that probably most of you have at least heard before, if not maybe even are a little familiar with. Um, It's Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, and it's got that verse in it, and you can say it with me if you know it. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Way to go. That was awesome. Um, We even have a nickname for that verse, right? You remember what it is? The Great Commission, right? We've got a cool little name for it. Um, I think every sermon that I've ever heard on Matthew 28, verse 19, um, or every discussion that I've heard on that verse, and you hear a lot of sermons on that verse, um, make, make that verse a directive for evangelism right, for telling people about Jesus. And it is that, go and make disciples, that's very much a directive to tell people about Jesus. But that's only its secondary purpose, especially when you look at the context of the verses around it. Because more than more than this verse being a rallying cry to get people out there to go on mission trips and knock on doors, this section of verses we're going to be spending some time in today is an assurance for people who are maybe reluctant to do that and maybe even having some doubts about that. So if you've ever been reluctant to take on this role of someone who's going to go and make disciples of all nations or to take on that role of being a representative for Jesus, then know that you, you are not alone. You are in good company. So our section of verses kind of has its beginning a few verses earlier on Easter Sunday morning. And I think you probably all know the Easter story, right? So the Easter story, it begins with two women who were both named Mary. That's just a coincidence. And they go to the tomb where Jesus was buried. Remember, he was um, killed on Friday, so Saturday, and now it's Sunday. They're going there to honor Jesus and his body. They get to the tomb, and you know what they find, right? They find that it's empty, except for an angel. The angel tells them, hey, Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. So the women get really excited. They start going back to where they were to tell the disciples that Jesus was alive. And who stops them along the way except Jesus? And Jesus stops these two women, both named Mary. And he greets them. He tells them not to be afraid. And then he gives them a message. He says to these two women to go and tell my brothers to wait for me in Galilee. Now that's Matthew 28, verse 10. Our text begins Matthew 28, 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. This is not the first time that these 11 disciples had seen Jesus. The timeline between verse 10 and 16 isn't totally clear, but they'd at least seen Jesus a few times. You remember that time maybe when when Jesus appeared to doubting Thomas, right? And he said, Thomas, you can touch my hands and touch my side. So that was one time. And that was a week after he'd already appeared to all the disciples except for Thomas. So they'd seen Jesus a few times and they knew that he was alive. But to be honest, you've got to think that a lot of these appearances of Jesus were kind of these like random out of nowhere things, right? Where Jesus would just show up. He would show him his hands, he'd show him his side. He'd give them a message, and then he'd kind of just leave. And you've got to think that the disciples kind of just left those encounters just reeling, right? Like, what's going on? So they knew that Jesus was alive, but beyond that, they were maybe having more questions than answers. So they were kind of excited to get to this point, to go to this prearranged meeting where Jesus said, I'm going to come to you and wait for me here, where they could maybe finally have some time with just them and Jesus with no distractions, where they could take some time and let Jesus kind of just lay it all out, right, to fill in the gaps for them. So they get to the mountain. They find Jesus already waiting for them there. And it says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, the first reaction of those disciples probably makes sense, right, that they worshiped him. He was dead. Now he's alive. They're excited to see him, so they worship him. 
Maybe some of you have been doing a little bit of worshiping also lately as some of these um, lockdown restrictions are getting a little bit looser and families are starting to reunite. And if you haven't seen grandma for like three or four months and then you see her minivan drive up the driveway and by the time her feet finally hit that pavement, right, there's little grandkid arms around her knees and grandma's getting down on the ground and showering her grandbabies with kisses and hugs. That's, that's kind of what the same thing they did here. Except, of course, this is more than a reunion. This is these men acknowledging that what Jesus had said he was, the Son of God, is true, and that he rose from the dead is proof of that. This is these men finally getting the chance to honor Jesus as God, as much God as the Father and as the Spirit, as part of that three-in-one Trinity God. Some worshipped, but then the second reaction they have is that some doubted. And how do you feel about that? You know, there's some commentators on this particular verse that really have a problem with the fact that some of Jesus' 11 disciples, some of the inner circle, would actually doubt Jesus. And they'll even, they'll even kind of try to soften this verse a little bit. And they'll say that um, even though Matthew only specifies the 11 disciples who were there, I'll go back a verse, right there in verse 16. Um, that doesn't mean that there couldn't have been more disciples there too, you know? And so they'll say that maybe in, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about this time that Jesus appeared to 500 disciples. And so some commentators say, well, maybe this was that time. And even though Matthew only says 11, there were a lot more that were there. And, and I guess that's a possibility, right? I think, I think syntactically, it makes the most sense if we take the disciples as the ones who are doubting because that's the subject of this, of this verse that Matthew puts in place there. But it could have been that there were more people there. But I guess it doesn't really bug me that the disciples doubted, that 11 human beings doubted. And in fact, I think I kind of like the fact that they doubted because it helps me for all those times that I know I doubt. Let's look a little bit at what their doubt was founded in. You know, when they came to this mountain, Jesus was really bringing them to this pretty significant transitional point. So three years prior to this, Jesus had come to these men and he had called them from where they were. So some of them he called from careers. Some of them he had called from their families or their friends or their lifestyles. And, and they responded, right? They followed him. And for the last three years, these 11 men had been listening to Jesus. They'd been going where he went They'd been doing what he did and what he told them to do. They'd, they'd been following his directions, and yeah, they hadn't been perfect with it, but Jesus would give them instructions, and, and they would respond. But now, all of a sudden, Jesus isn't giving them the next step. He's not with them day by day by day. He's kind of been sporadic in his presence with them since he rose from the dead. And pretty soon, when he ascends, he's not going to be with them at all. Rather than Jesus giving them the next steps over and over again, now he's telling them that it's up to them to find the next step. And there, at least some of them, aren't quite comfortable with that. Moreover, they're not quite sure if, if they want to. Because that next step that Jesus is encouraging them to figure out to do on their own is to represent him, to make disciples of all nations. And, and it's one thing to follow someone, but completely another thing to represent someone, right? So I bet if I pull up your Facebook page right now and put it up on the screen, and I'm not going to do that, and we looked at all of your likes, right? So all of the different pages you follow, the different people you follow, the causes you support, the places you shop at, the politicians you support, the celebrities that you like, how many of those things that you follow would you also be willing to represent? Probably a pretty small percentage of them, right? Because to follow something, all you have to do is, is enjoy being around it, right? To like it or to be curious about it. But to represent something, you need to be committed to it. You need to be saying that everything that this person or cause represents, I agree with it. You need to be willing to, to make that voice your voice. And some of these disciples, they, they weren't ready for that yet. They still had doubts, even about who Jesus was, 
All right, and what were behind those doubts? I mean, maybe there were some of the big obvious things that he said he was God, but you look at him and he doesn't look like what a God looks like, right? He looks just like a dude. He rose from the dead, apparently, but that doesn't match at all the way that science and biology works. So we're kind of wondering if maybe we need to put some distance here with this thing that we can't understand happening. And there were probably a lot of other doubts that were going on too, and beyond this, it would kind of just be speculating for them. So maybe a more productive thing we could do, instead of guessing at their doubts, is to put ourselves in their shoes and to say, if Jesus came to you right now, and he called you to represent him, what would make you reluctant to take on that role? What would make you doubt that he really is who he said he is? Doubts come in a lot of different places, but by and large, where they start is in our emotions. When we see something in the world that doesn't match the way we think the world is supposed to be or the way we think God is supposed to be. So for example, when we see all this violence happening right now and all this division and hatred and racism, and we think if God is a God of love and he created these people, how in the world is this happening? Or you look at the devastation that this pandemic is wreaking and has wreaked on our world, and you think if God cares about his people, how could he let this happen? And our emotions see this and they react to that. Sometimes doubt takes the next place, though, the next step, and it becomes an argument that challenges us that we don't have an answer to. So maybe it's, it's something you hear or you see. Maybe you're watching TV, and this guy with a really impressive white beard and a lot of letters after his names and degrees, and he's written books, makes this super compelling argument that the Bible is clearly something that is disproved and is edited by later redactors and isn't at all the authoritative word of God. And, and you don't have an answer for that. And then our reason starts to doubt God and his promises. And then doubt can come from one deeper place too. It can come from, like, from our will. Some of us are preconditioned almost to doubt the word of God and to doubt Jesus. If you're someone who's grown up in a house that, that wasn't a Christian household, and maybe that means that you just, it simply wasn't, you weren't Christian, or, or maybe it was Christian in name, but you never talked about God's word and you can never remember going to church with your mom and dad except for maybe Easter every now and then. When you come to Jesus and God's word, you might have an inherent skepticism that someone else who grew up in a Christian household doesn't have. But whether you grew up in a Christian household or not, there's a volitional doubt that is common to every single one of us simply because we're humans. And that's that in our nature, we are bent to not be able to understand or accept free forgiveness. That God accepts us based on something he has done, not something that, that we can do. Man, and there's so many other doubts, right? And, and I don't want to talk about them more because I might put them in your heads. But all these doubts, they swim around in our heads, in our hearts. And so when Jesus comes to us and he calls us to, to find him where he's told us that we can find him, and we come to Jesus, there's part of us that wants to fall down and worship, but then right at the same time, there's part of us, there's part of us that doesn't. It's part of us that takes a step back that doubts. And can I tell you that that's okay? Because Jesus approaches both hearts the exact same way. To the heart that worships him and a heart that doubts him. Jesus takes a step towards that heart. Jesus initiates love. And Jesus gives not, not a directive to not doubt, not a description of what we can do to do more, to be stronger, but he gives an answer. He gives an answer not for the what we should do, but for the why. Why we can trust him. Why we can feel safe following him and doing his work. Jesus, he came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The man that they'd been following for the last three years wasn't just a man. He was God. The person you've been listening to during this worship service for the last 30 minutes is not just a man. He's God. The one who comes to you in your confusion and says, I am here. The one who comes to you in your fear 
and says, I'm bigger. The one who comes to you and you're hurt and he says, I love you, is not just a man. He's God. He is one with the Father who created you, who created your brain in the way you think, who created your heart in the way you love, who created everything about you in this world that we live in. He is one with the Spirit who speaks that crystal clear truth in a world of such clanging and loud relativities. He is the Redeemer who gave everything up to make you one with him, to bring you home. And I know that anyone can make that claim, right, to be God. And anyone can try to seize that authority of being God. But to this person, to Jesus, look at that. It was given to him. And the proof that it was given to him is the fact that he was dead, and now he's not. His resurrection. Jesus comes to us with all authority of the triune God, and he has the right to call us. He has the right to to ask us to make disciples into him. And we can be completely confident in following him and obeying him and bringing other people to follow him too because who else are we going to follow if not the God of the universe? And he brings us to this point, to this, to this line that he calls us to cross, a line from simply following orders to following faith, a line from just being a disciple, which we still need to be, to making disciples. And he says to us, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. With the full authority of the triune God, God calls us to make disciples. And then he equips us with that same power too. We make disciples, right? Not by... Not by slinging cool catchphrases to people. Not by trying to argue them into submission so that we can drag them to church. We make disciples of people by being vessels of his power. Of power that he gives us in the means of grace, the word and sacrament. Through baptism, through the water and the word, God comes to people and he brings them into his family and he makes them his own. As we open our lips and as we let the word of God fly, we let God's words come out not to try to affirm our, our stance or our political position, but to give life. And as we speak through these means of grace and as we bring people to the waters of baptism, God makes disciples. Now there's one little word in this verse that we haven't spent a lot of time on here yet. And it's the word that most people spend a lot of time on when they're preaching on this section of God's word. It's that little two-letter word, go, right? Um, how many times have people commanded mission trips halfway across the world or tens of thousands of dollars in outreach budgets in pursuit of this word, to go? And that's all good stuff, right? Mission trips and stuff, that's all things that God works through to spread his word around the world. But it's not the primary push of what Jesus is saying here. If you want to get all nerdy about it, that word go is an adverbial participle to the main verb of the sentence, which is make disciples. So rather than Jesus saying, go and make disciples, it's as if he's saying, while you're going, make disciples. Or like, since you're already going, make disciples. So it's a little bit of a different feel, huh? Because the truth is, all of you are already going, right? You're going to work, you're going to practice, you're going to school, you're going to cookouts at your friend's house, you're going to your Facebook page and you're typing stuff. We're all going. And Jesus says now, while you're going, make disciples. When you go to work, speak God's grace, and he'll make disciples through that. When you use social media, speak God's grace. And he makes disciples. When you go to your friend's house, speak God's grace. When you parent your children, speak God's grace. And he makes disciples through that. When you bring your sons and daughters to the font, God gives his grace. And he makes disciples through that. And as we go, and as God makes disciples through us, the same triune God who calls us and who empowers us is with us every step of the way. He says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. There's no challenge that we can face or no, no obstacle in front of us or no doubt or no fear that we have or no mistake that we can make or no hurt that we can feel 
that the triune God of the universe is not with us for. He's been holding our hands through all of this, and he'll keep holding our hands until the very end of the age. Because this calling he gives us is not just something he gives us to bide our time here on earth, something to temporally affect people's lives. It's something that's affected our eternity already and that gives eternity to other people. With these verses then, Matthew closes up his gospel, which I find really interesting because the Jesus story isn't over yet with those verses. There's still something pretty significant that Jesus has to do, right? He has to ascend into heaven, and that would be the end of the Jesus story. But Matthew cuts it short because for him, this moment right here was the transition moment. The transition moment from Jesus doing ministry here on earth to his disciples doing ministry here on earth. To you doing ministry here on earth. The triune God has called you, he's equipped you and empowered you, and he goes with you. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, in your grace, you have come to us through your word, through baptism, and you have brought us into God's family. Thank you for that calling that you've given us from darkness into light. Give us the confidence to know that you who've called us and brought us into God's family speak with the full authority of God. And as you send us to make disciples in the world, that that is something we can feel safe and confident doing because we have the backing of God behind us. We ask that you would give us opportunities to speak your message to people in our lives. We ask that when we have that chance to speak your message, you would bless those words, that through what we say, you can make disciples of people. And we ask that throughout the world, you would continue to push your gospel to bring peace to the earth, to bring love to the earth, but more than that, to bring life, that people through your word might know you, and that they might have eternity with you. We ask this in your name, dear Jesus. Amen.